Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nadia Al Ali. I'm the director of the Center for Middle East Studies at Brown. Um, it's our great pleasure to host today's event. And I should mention that today's event is part of a series that our colleague, um, Professor Adi Ophir, is organizing a series on anti-Semitism. And today, uh, we are uh, very happy to welcome Ella Lapidot, who is professor and chair of Jewish studies at the University of Lille in France. He's holding a PhD in philosophy from the Paris Sabon University. And he has taught philosophy, Jewish thought, and Talmud at the University of Bern in Switzerland, as well as at the Humboldt University and Freie Universität in Berlin. And I understand he's joining us from Berlin now. Professor Lapidot's work reflects the relation between knowledge and politics, especially in modern and contemporary cultures. Among his publications, Jews Out of the Question, a critique of anti-Semitism, anti which was published um, in t uh, 2020. The Hebrew translation with introduction and commentary of Hegel's Phenomenologie des Geistes, which was also published in 2020. Heidegger and Jewish Thought, Difficult Others, which was edited with um, M. Brumlich, published in 2018, and Etre sans mot dire, la logique de son design on site, <laughs> which was published in 2010. So today, uh, the talk today is entitled Jews Out of the Question, How Critical Theory Fights Antisemitism by Denying Judaism. Please help me to welcome Professor Lapidot. Um, and uh, just um, so you're going to give a lecture for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll have time for a Q&A. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you uh, very much for the invitation, Adi and Nadia. Um, I'm very honored to be here at the uh, University of Brown at the Center of Middle East Studies. Um, as uh, as uh, Nadia uh, already uh, announced, I will present uh, some ideas in the next 40, 45 minutes, and then I will try to stop. Uh, if, I, <laughs> if I have difficulties, help me. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then we'll open discussion. I'll be happy to hear your questions, uh, and we we'll try to answer them as much as I can. That's, uh, that's the title, very long title, uh, How Critical Theory Fights Antisemitism anti by Denying Judaism. Basically, what I'm going to do is just explain this title, okay, in the next 40 uh, minutes. So uh, a shorter title, if you wish, is a critique of anti-antisemitism. Now, I'm quickly going to say what it is and what it's not. It's not a defense of anti-Semitism. I'm not calling for you to become anti-Semites. That's not the point. It's, uh, on the contrary, it's an internal critique of um, what I think is a dominant strategy of uh, countering, fighting, struggling against anti-Semitism uh, after, after the Shoah, after the Holocaust. Mostly I'm focusing on attempts to counter anti-Semitism in theory, in people who are writing theory, philosophy, uh, political thought. That's, that's my focus, but I think it goes beyond that, but this is what, mainly what I will talk, uh, I'm talking about. Now, it's an internal critique in the sense that I'm asking, uh, is this dominant strategy, as I uh, diagnose it, is it a good one? Uh, is, is it a good way of countering anti-Semitism? or not, and what I'm claiming that there, there are some problems with this strategy, 
and to some extent, it's uh, it's it's even uh, um, uh, counterproductive. There are some consequences of the way that has been chosen that uh, that is not only problematic, but in some way even reproduces some patterns that you can find in anti-Semitism itself. So anti-Semitism anti reproduces some elements, I will tell you exactly why, that you can find in anti-Semitism. This is why it's counterproductive. This is why I say there is a problem we might want to rethink how we handle with that. So that's, that's the basic idea. The structure of what I'm going to do is first I'm going to uh, I'm going to say what I'm not going to do. Uh, there are other critiques of anti-antisemitism, uh, of the way we try to fight in theory against antisemitism. I'm going to talk about other, what other people are doing, and, uh, uh, and then I'm going to move to, um, to talk about what I'm doing, the essence of my critique uh, that is encapsulated in this title, Jews Out of the Question. I'm going to explain the title to you. Uh, then I'm going to move to uh, quickly try to articulate the basic, the core of my, my argument. Uh, I'm calling it de-epistemicizing the Jew. Uh, I'm going to explain to you what it means in my title. It's hidden in the words denying Judaism. Then I'm going to move uh, and um, I'm going to speak about a few consequences that follow from my core critique of anti-antisemitism. I'm going to call it um, uh, anti-antisemitic epistemology. Namely, I think there is a whole discourse that is built around this theory, uh, theoretical discourse of anti-antisemitism, and I'm going to talk about a few moments, problematic moments of that discourse, and I'm going to conclude by suggesting uh, um, a, 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 an alternative, a different way of facing anti-semitism uh, that, uh, that is different than anti-antisemitism that goes uh, to a different direction that I'm going to signal using the keywords Talmud. Okay, that's, that's the journey. So I'm going to start, as I uh, uh, promised, with telling you what I'm not going to do, uh, other critiques of anti-antisemitism. There has been few people already discussing, problematizing the, the, the discourse of anti-antisemitism. When I'm saying anti-antisemitism, again, to make clear, I'm talking about a dominant way of countering anti-Semitism. Okay, so there has been other critiques. I think one of the most important ones uh, uh, has been circling around the problem of obliterating the Muslim or the Arab. So uh, fighting anti-antisemitism and forgetting the question, the, the figure, uh, the set of phenomena uh, that is associated with the, with the Muslim and the Arab. There is a, 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 a one way of problematizing uh, anti-antisemitism in this direction. It's under the title instrumentalization, namely how, uh, how the, um, um, the outcry, the struggle against anti-Semitism is used, instrumentalized politically by different uh, voices, different uh, uh, organizations uh, to defend uh, Israeli politics, anti-Palestinian politics, and delegitimized critiques or critiques against the politics of Israel are stamped anti-Semitic, and this is a way of instrumentalizing anti-anti-Semitism. Uh, another uh, way of using it uh, um, is uh, to justify hostility towards Muslim and Arab by saying there is a new kind of anti-Semitism that's coming from Arabs and Muslim, and this is a way of, uh, of, of creating a hostile discourse towards Arabs and, and Muslim. This is under the title instrumentalization, this is one way of problematizing anti-antisemitism. There is another level, another discourse that goes in this direction that is more theoretical. Uh, one of the first uh, to have uh, perhaps um, s said something in this direction is Edward Said in Orientalism. He already, uh, he already uh, indicated how antisemitism is conceptually linked to Orientalism and anti uh, Islamism or anti-Arabism or Islamophobia, he already pointed out that we tend to forget that there is connection between them. And uh, someone who took it uh, um, uh, forward, this uh, critique, is uh, Gil Anijar. In f few publications, he, uh, he um, spoke about how, uh, how Jewish and, uh, and Muslim or Arab are two figures that we need to understand together as having been constructed uh, 
as two enemies of Western Christianity, and we need to think about them together, how they are being constructed by Western Christianity as the enemies of Western Christianity, and as enemies one against the other. And uh, uh, according to Gil Gilanijar, by focusing on, uh, when we talk about anti-Semitism, when we focus him on the anti-Jewish aspect of anti-Semitism and forgetting to think it together with the anti-Muslim uh, or anti-Arab side of anti-Semitism, we are obliterating uh, uh, an important part and, uh, and we are uh, uh, reproducing, reproducing the discourse of anti-Semitism itself and the even uh, more basic discourse of Semitism. Uh, that is based, according to uh, this critique, uh, about a certain obliteration of the Muslim uh, and, and only focusing on the Jewish. So this is one direction that I'm gonna, not going to talk about. Now you're welcome to read Gil's books. They are very interesting. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, problematize anti-Semitism anti in a different way. I'm not going to focus about uh, the question of the Arab and the Muslim. I'm going to look on the Jewish Part, so on the anti-Jewish aspect of anti-Semitism. And uh, um, as I said, my critique of anti-Semitism, the way I problematize anti-Semitism, I ca encapsulated with the title uh, Jews Out of the Question, the book that I published. Um, and I'm going to explain to you very quickly what is, the, what is the point of my critique and why did I call it uh, Jews Out of the Question. So, if Gil uh, uh, Anija was talking about obliterating the, the, the Muslim in the discourse of anti-Semitism, anti I'm talking about the obliteration of the Jewish. Okay, so I'm saying anti-anti-Semitism is in a, the, the dominant way of anti-anti-Semitism risks and in a sense uh, generates a certain obliteration of the Jewish and Judaism. Uh, and what I mean by that is that uh, the discourse of anti-antisemitism dissolves, dissolves, tries to, uh, uh, tries to do away, remove, uh, abolish the Jewish question, which is one of the tropes, central tropes of uh, historical uh, antisemitism. Try to do away with the Jewish question by ex excluding the Jewish Judaism from the realm of questions of thought of what I call epistem, namely the, it's, it's a word that I use that uh, some people use like Michel Foucault and other people to talk about the realm of knowledge or what we sometimes call philosophy, thinking, theory, knowledge, science. I use this word epistem uh, and what I'm saying is by um, the, the strategy that anti-antisemitism has been using to get over the Jewish question is to say, let's not speak about Jews. Let's just take the Jews out of the question. And this is the ambivalent uh, 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 title that I chose, Jews out of the question. Namely, we should not uh, ask, uh, talk about uh, the Jewish question anymore. Namely, we should stop being anti-Semites. But at the same time, uh, Jews uh, are not to be discussed at all, out of the question in the idiomatic sense of English, out of the question. This is not something that we're going to discuss. So this is the ambivalent uh, movement that I'm trying to talk about in anti-Semitism. Anti okay? So enough with the Jewish question, but also enough about Jews. That's the, that's the ambiv ambivalence in the center. Uh, there, are two, there are two contemporary debates, let's say, that this kind of reflection is connected to. Maybe you've heard about the term epistemicide. Um, it's a, it's, it was coined by uh, Boaventura de Sousa Santos with respect to um, uh, what, what is called today the knowledge of the global south. So how European civilization in different ways did not only commit genocides, killing of peoples, but also uh, obliterated cultures of knowledge. Okay, this is why epistemicide, the killing of knowledge. So what I'm talking about is connected to that. It's a phenomena, if you wish, of epistemicide. That's just one hint for you. Uh, and a certain, uh, a, a different way that I'm trying to um, generalize my reflection is also talking about what I call negative political epistemology, which is again a general phenomena of, uh, of, of dissociating knowledge 
from politics or dissociating knowledge from uh, the discourse about collective subject, about people, nations, groups, and so forth. I'm not going to go into that, just give you a hint uh, about the horizons uh, where, I'm, where I'm talking. Okay, so I'm going now to tell you very quickly what is my basic <coughs> argument when I'm talking about Jews out of the question and the ambivalence of anti-Semitism. Anti you could uh, understand what I'm saying uh, in the following way. There is uh, a very obvious way in which anti-anti-Semitic discourse uh, functions, and now I'm not talking only about theory, I'm also actually talking about uh, operational um, um, legal uh, definitions of, uh, contemporary definitions of anti-Semitism, and uh, the basic way, if you wish, of uh, denouncing anti-Semitism today is uh, by um, critiquing uh, any kind of uh, uh, taking of a negative position against Jews as Jews, okay? Being hostile uh, uh, against Jews as Jews, Jews as such. I quickly, I, 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 I gave you two, uh, two uh, quote, quotes from, from the two uh, today, uh, I think, most uh, prevalent definitions of, uh, of anti-Semitism, uh, the Ira one and the more recent one, uh, the Jerusalem uh, Declaration. And as you see, uh, it's, it's only small parts of the definitions, but I think it captures the core of what I'm saying. Uh, if you would just see a, a, the more recent one, the Jerusalem de Declaration, uh, any, any hostility, prejudice against Jews as Jews, uh, or Jewish institution as Jewish. So that's the, the idea is taking a negative uh, position against uh, Jews as such. However, and this is where I'm coming to the problematization, what I am claiming is a, uh, a certain catch or a danger or a problem in this, uh, in this strategy, precluding any negative evaluation as such for Jewishness or Jews as Jews, precluding any evaluation of Jews as Jews leads or can lead or tends to lead to precluding any value of Jewishness. Namely, precluding any possibility, that's what I'm trying to think about, of giving any what I call epistemic content for Jews as Jews. Namely, associating Jewishness or Judaism with any idea, and now you could choose whatever word you like, idea, worldview, concept, ethics, thought, principles, anything that you could criticize, that you could be against, and anything that you could be embracing. Okay? If in principle you say there is nothing that you can be against, it means that there is also nothing that you can embrace, that you could like, which means there is no content. I call it epistemic content. This is, this is the problematization, the basic problematization of saying, in principle, you could not say could not take a negative attitude, position towards Jews as Jews. What I'm saying then, you could also not any positive position towards Jews as Jews, and basically what it means is that you preclude that there is any content that you can like or not like in Judaism. And the uh, radical way that I'm <coughs> formulating this problem is denying or precluding the very existence of Judaism, namely as a world of knowledge that has some contents, some identifiable contents, whatever that may be. That's the basic argument, the basic way I problematize anti-antisemitism. And now I'm talking on the level of, of operative definitions, not yet the theory. Now I wanna go on the level of theory and I wanna talk about a few consequences, a few manifestations of this problematic that arise from the way in which anti-antisemitism becomes a certain discourse that has different aspects that I want to point out by looking at different 
thinkers, post-Holocaust thinkers, that were writing in a theoretical way, conceptual way, about anti-Semitism. So I'm going to quickly uh, look at a few elements, what I call elements of anti-anti-Semitic political epistemology. These elements of is a, a quote of uh, Adorno and Horkheimer. They talk about elements of anti-Semitism. So I'm talking about elements of anti-anti-Semitism. So the first element that I want to uh, point at is what happens when you preclude any epistemic value or content of Jewish, as Jewish, Jewishness or Judaism. What it means is that the only collective subjectivity that you are left with to talk about as a real collective subjectivity that does have any kind of content are not Jews, but anti-Semites. So the anti-Semite, the anti-Semitic collective becomes the real collective that anti-anti-Semitic discourse talks about. This is the real collective that is being discussed. And because anti-Semitism, because there is no real Jewish knowledge or content, Anti-Semitism has no object. When anti-Semite speaks against Jews and we preclude that there is any content for Judaism or Jewishness, we preclude that anti-Semitic discourse talks about a real thing in the world, it means that anti-Semitism has no real object. There is no Jew as Jew. There is no Jewishness or Judaism. Namely, so goes the argument, anti-Semitism has no real object or has nothing to do with real Jews. That's something that you will hear very often in the context of anti-Semitism or anti-anti-Semitism. There is no connection between anti-Semitism and real Jews. What it means, and uh, uh, very quickly I will uh, point out a, 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 a uh, language rule that is being uh, produced from this idea, it means that uh, you should not think about anti-Semitism as a kind of knowledge that is a real anti against something. And this means that even the word itself, anti-Semitism, should not be understood as anti-something, but should just be understood as one word, anti-Semitism. And there is, in the last decade, uh, I don't know if in, in Brown you uh, embraced that or not, but in different universities there is a, 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 a regulation that you should stop writing anti-Semitism with a hyphen, and you should write it uh, de-hyphenated, anti-Semitism, because there is no object. There is no real anti. There is nothing at the other side. Uh, it's a real thing. Um, what it means, second, is that the way that the uh, people who deal with anti-Semitism, the way that they perceive the phenomena that they're talking about, is as basically not a knowledge phenomena, namely not as a certain position, anti-Semitism is not a certain position towards something in the world, but it is a psychological state. Anti-Semitism is like a, some kind of a mental state it is a psychological condition of the anti-Semite. As I said, the anti-Semite is the real subject we're talking about. And anti-Semitism is some kind of psychological, usual, of course, pathological condition. And uh, the first who have um, um, developed this kind of understanding of anti-Semitism, uh, or the most famous one, are Adorno and Horkheimer, uh, who are already in the 40s, published one of the first um, theoretical discussions of anti-Semitism uh, in their book, Dialectic of uh, Aufklärung, of uh, Enlightenment, and they described anti-Semitism anti as a state of paranoia. And uh, later, uh, Adorno participated in a project that is called the Authoritarian Personality, where he uh, used also um, empirical research to try to characterize the uh, anti-Semitic personality, and I quote very quickly uh, what he wrote in 1950, anti-Semitism is not so much dependent upon the nature of the object, 
anti-Semitism or Jews as upon the subject's own psychological wants and needs. So you, so to speak, blare out there is no uh, Jews that anti-Semitism refers to. It is some kind of an inner psychological problem of an the anti-Semite. Second element that I want to talk about uh, is what happens about uh, Judaism, what happened about Jewish thought, what happens about any kind of discourse that does try to identify uh, an epistemic content of Judaism. I, I, the key words I use is Jewish thought. What is Jewish thought? What happens with Jewish thought, namely with the idea that there is some kind of a uh, epistemic uh, Jewish world, it becomes in these discourse, anti-antisemitic discourse, based on the premises that I was talking about, Jewish thought becomes an anti-Semitic fantasy. A fantasy, myth, another word that is used very often in the context is conspiracy. There is a conspiracy theory. I mean, if you talk about Jewish thought, it means that you speak about conspiracy of different individuals. Uh, and the, uh, the, the way that, uh, that anti antisemitic theory, the one that I'm talking about, try to understand what is Jewish thought is that it's a creation, a fantastic creation of anti-Semites. These are the real subjects. So to say it very succinctly, anti-Semitism creates Judaism. It's Judaism is an idea, a fantasy that uh, is being created by anti-Semites. And this is one of the basic ideas that you will find in Adorn and Horkheimer's analysis in their book that I mentioned, Dialectic der Aufklärung, 444. The paranoid anti-Semite creates everything in his own image. There is a psychological disturbance that is called anti-Semitism, and this psychological disturbance creates certain fantasies about Judaism, about uh, Jewish thought. This is uh, uh, what is very often um, articulated by the word projection. It's a projection, Judaism or Jewish thought or Jewish knowledge or Jewish ethics and so forth, or Jewish philosophy, it's a projection of anti-Semites. So this is the second uh, element. The first was that the actual subjectivity, the actual subject, the collective subject, is anti-Semites. Second one is that Jewish thought is a projection, fantasy of this collective. Third element is a consequence of the second. Namely, if it is anti-Semitism that creates Judaism, if Jewish thought is a fantasy of anti-Semites, it means that any talk, any discourse, any claim that there is Jewish thought is akin to anti-Semitism, is somehow already uh, tainted, it's already complicit with anti-Semitism, speaking about Jewish thought is in a way already somehow anti-Semitic because Judaism is a creation of anti-Semitism. What this means, and this is the difficult uh, move here, and this is where I'm starting to talk about complicity or affinity between anti-anti-Semitism and anti-Semitism, is that even a self-claim by Jews themselves about that when they speak about uh, Judaism or Jewish thought or Jewish ethics is becoming identified or problematized as, in a sense, complicit with anti-Semitism. Namely, Judaism itself, the discourse about Judaism, about Jewish thought, Jews who speak about Jewish thought are being problematized as, in a sense, cooperating with anti-Semitism. That's the difficult turn in this discourse, and which is what I call the anti-Jewish anti turn of anti-anti-Semitism. So anti-anti-Semitic discourse becomes, in a sense, anti-Jewish. And the two, uh, the two um, 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 thinkers that I think uh, in the last 50, 60 years have produced this kind of problematic turn of anti books of anti-antisemitism toward anti-Judaism are uh, uh, Hannah Arendt and Alain Badiou. Um, I, for the sake of uh, formulation, I called it 
the position that they both in different ways developed, I call it Judaism creates anti-Semitism. Namely, Judaism is a real tradition, but it is a problematic tradition. Problematic tradition that precisely created this kind of myth about Jewish thought that at a certain point gave birth to anti-Semitism. So this is a problematic turn that I try to, uh, to talk about. I will not go into the, here the specifics of how these two thinkers, I think, produced each in their way this kind of a position where they were trying to criticize anti-antisemitism. At a certain point, uh, their critique became a critique against Judaism. Uh, Hannah Arendt in her Origins of Totalitarianism and Alain Badiou in his um, uh, different books, uh, the books, uh, the book on Saint Paul from uh, 97 and his uh, collection of essays from 2005 about, um, about uh, basically Judaism. So this was, this was the third element, how anti-antisemitism becomes anti-Jewish, which is the problematic, I think, the most problematic aspect of this discourse. Now I want to turn to the last, uh, the last element of what I call anti-antisemitic -anti uh, discourse or anti-antisemitic epistemology. What is happening uh, here is uh, the, um, the phenomena that anti-antisemitism does not, of course, explicitly want to abolish, eradicate, obliterate uh, Jewishness or Jews. Obviously, especially uh, after the Holocaust, anti-antisemitism is a pro-Jewish discourse in the most basic sense. Now, what it means is that anti-antisemitism does have some kind of a notion, an idea, a figure, a positive figure of Jews as a collective. It's not that there is a complete uh, negation or denial that there is a Jewish collective, there are Jews. So the question is, what kind of Jewishness, what kind of Jewish collective is posited, is accepted, admitted, and in a sense produced or generated by anti-Semitic -anti discourse? So what I claim is that there is a certain collective figure of Jews that is identified and produced by anti-Semitism. -anti and this is precisely the figure of a collective subject that has no collective knowledge, what I call succinctly a de-epistemized collective, a collective without knowledge. I think the way that it is usually, um, this collective is usually designated in the discourse I'm talking about is through um, notions such as living Jews, real Jews, Jews flesh and blood, and it's usually these terms are polemic terms. They mean and not Jews with knowledge, not Jews with thought. This is the way that the de-epistemized collective of Judaism is being designated. Now the question, of course, who are these Jews, living Jews that don't have Judaism? And of course here, uh, there are different candidates uh, with what you can associate them. You can associate them with modern Jews, Jews who indeed uh, uh, lost any connection with any traditional knowledge, <coughs> practice of Judaism, secular Jews, assimilated Jews, non-Jewish Jews. There are different ways we can uh, identify these Jews. I want to offer one very quickly, because uh, I'm almost out of time, very quickly, I'm going to point out at one thinker, Jean-Paul Sartre, a French philosopher, who offered, I think, an interesting take on that, on who are these Jews without Judaism, Jews without Jewish knowledge. He wrote one of the first texts uh, on uh, anti-Semitism after the Holocaust, uh, 
called Réflexion sur la question juive, uh, in 1946. I think it was called, uh, it was translated to English as uh, the Jew, uh, the anti-Semite and the Jew. And his point was similarly to what Adorno and Horkheimer said, that Judaism is created by uh, anti-Semites, he said something very similar. He said it's the anti-Semite, I'm quoting, who makes the Jew. But his point, Sartre, was not that it's a fantasy, that the anti-Semites creates or makes the Jew as a figure of fantasy. What he claimed, and it's connected to his entire philosophy, is that the gaze of the anti-Semite, the way anti-Semites look at Jews, hate, uh, are being hostile toward Jews, generates an actual consciousness within the people that are being exposed to anti-Semitism, generates a certain Jewish consciousness. So there is an actual creation of Jews through anti-Semites. Anti-Semitism actually creates Jews, not only as a fantasy, but in reality. Now, this, is a very, th this was a, an interesting point that he made, and it was actually uh, it had a huge influence in France after the war because many Jews actually felt that he said something true, that this is, was their own experience, mostly precisely assimilated Jews that did not have any, uh, anything to do with Judaism anymore, and only through anti-Semitism so they discovered that they were, uh, they were Jews. So it was uh, a very influential uh, a theory, and Sartre was able to actually uh, describe a real phenomena of what I call a de-epistemized Jewish collective that was created, so to speak, through anti-Semitism. Anti now, the problem is, of course, is that uh, for Sartre, that is, that is Judaism. This is the, uh, the model of Judaism, the model of the Jewish uh, subject. This is the problem in what he was saying, although he was describing something that was actually true. Now, I want to point out and, and, and end with that, that there is, you could say there is actually a very central collective phenomena of Jewishness in modernity that you could say has been created in a sense that uh, has been described by Sartre, namely a certain Jewishness that was created as a response to anti-Semitism and was developed as an anti-anti-Semitic subject, a Jewish subject whose sole Jewish knowledge is that they are against anti-Semitism. And this is what uh, you all probably know under the title of Zionism. So in many ways, if you f look at uh, uh, Zionist writings, you see that the way that Zionist thinkers, the founders of Zionism, described, so to speak, how they came to their project, to their understanding, to their own self-understanding as Jews, was as a reaction of their exposure to anti-Semitism. So I brought you a, a letter by uh, Theodor Herzl, uh, one of the uh, great founders of, of, of Zionism, r writing to uh, a friend in 80, 1895. I was indifferent to my Jewishness, but anti-Semitism forced my Jewishness to the surface. And if you look at, uh, uh, at Herzl's project, you can see how precisely anti-anti-Semitism in a sense for him, is the, the force that moves Zionism. So that was the fourth element of what I call the anti-antisemitic epistemology, which is the most, uh, I think, um, realistic in a sense in its actual creation of a real political collective Jewish subject. I conclude. I conclude. I promise that I will uh, end by pointing beyond anti-antisemitism. And uh, what I want to suggest is that there is not only a theoretical way, but an actual way of countering, resisting, fighting anti-Semitism by understanding anti-Semitism 
as a form of anti-Judaism that reacts to something real in the world, to actual what I call Jewish knowledge or Jewish episteme, namely not as Adorno and Horkheimer and Sartre were thinking. However, understanding this Jewish episteme not as a proto-antisemitic one, namely not as the real model by which antisemitism was produced, which is, I think, what is, has been done by Arendt and uh, uh, Alain Badiou, but as a tradition of knowledge that offers a different political epistemology, a different way of understanding politics, a different way of understanding knowledge itself, which I'm not going to develop now. What I will do quickly, I will just point out that this way of reacting to antisemitism, namely by going back to a real tradition of Jewish knowledge that is different from antisemitism, has been developed by different people in the 20th century. One of the most, I think, important uh, person to do so is the French, Jewish French philosopher Emmanuel Levinas. I just sketched for you uh, a few uh, steps of what he was doing. I will uh, not repeat them. I will just say that if you trace his thought from the mid-30s to the mid-60s, you could see that he developed from a position of an assimilated Jew who, in fact, had nothing to do really with uh, any Jewish knowledge. He was studying philosophy in France. But by encountering anti-Semitism in the 30s, he developed a certain movement of return to uh, Jewish traditions of knowledge that he, at a certain point in the 60s, identified as Talmudic uh, tradition of thought and texts. And this is where, if you know something about Levinas, this is where his uh, entire corpus of Talmudic readings is coming from. So Levinas is a representative of a beyond anti-antisemitism, as I promised, beyond anti-antisemitism lies Talmud. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be very happy for any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for a very thought-provoking and provocative uh, talk. Um, we have time for questions. Uh, maybe I will take the chance and ask a question and give you a chance to think about your comments or questions. So I guess the first thing that sort of comes to my mind or the first question that comes to my mind as a feminist scholar is how, if and how um, this Jewish knowledge is contested and contested along, for me, the immediate thing that comes to mind is long gendered lines uh, uh, around racialized lines. And I, I know that you're speaking on the level of, I mean, a much more kind of abstract, philosophical, religious. Um, but I guess also being an anthropologist, I can't help but think about, I guess, uh, the real Jews who are producing, interpreting, and contesting that tradition and knowledge. And I guess I was wondering if you have some reflections on that. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Um, I think one of the basic problems is uh, what I call the political epistemology, namely the association of knowledge with the collective subjects. <clears throat> um, I think there is a certain... Um, resistance or, or problem of, of uh, accepting, uh, so to speak, that knowledge has a, can have a um, historical collective subjectivity, can be carried by groups that are defined by knowledge. Uh, and I think uh, one of the paradigms for this kind of uh, political epistemology has been uh, uh, Judaism. Mm. It has been Judaism. And... Um, I think you can already find that in the theological pre-modern layers of uh, Christian universalism <coughs> against any attempt to associate 
not knowledge, but let's say uh, faith or relation to God or whatever you want to call it with a specific uh, ethnos, specific group. And I think many of these tensions has been secularized into uh, to spe to, in the specific context of anti-Semitism into racial, uh, uh, racial discourse. Um, and I think this is what you can find in the anti-Semitic discourse. And this is what you will find transferred into the anti-anti-Semitic discourse. This figure of knowledge or a certain tradition of thought or a certain tradition of text that is associated also with a, with a collective practice over history, namely people, is something that is over and over being uh, posing a problem. And I think the, the so to speak, pre-Holocaust uh, strategy of doing uh, of, of, of expressing this problem was being anti-Jewish. The post-Holocaust uh, way of dealing with it was being, so to speak, denying uh, Judaism in order, so to speak, to be out of the question. That's more or less what, I, uh, what I'm thinking about. Thank you. I'm going to take uh, three questions. Uh, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so, yes, please. Thank you. You mentioned Levinas. I wonder what you think of Derrida. And the reason I ask is because it seems to me that the whole um, problem that you were, you were outlining so beautifully is um, the, the, the problem of the dialectic. So you have the turn of the screw. Well, you know, you have the paranoia, and then you have the return, and so forth. And so what Derrida is doing, it seems to me, is doing a critique of the dialectical turn of the screw, and some of that has to do with the Talmud. And so, so what would you? I'm curious why he, you mentioned Levinas and not Derrida. Uh, sorry, do you mind if we just take a few questions? Sure. Are you okay? Do you need some paper? Are you okay? You can. Yes, um, Michael. Can you pass it on? <coughs> Thanks. So you, you may be aware of a case of a. Of a a politician recently elected to Congress who turns out to have lied all the way through his uh, curriculum vitae. And, and one of his lies was that uh, some of his ancestors were Jews and Holocaust survivors. And when he was asked about this, he said, I never said they were Jews, I said they were Jewish. Uh, so in a, in a way, my question, which I tend seriously, is uh, about the epistemology of the Jewish. Because it, it seems to me uh, that one understanding or perhaps misunderstanding of the corrective uh, you're proposing is the creation of a certain kind of essentialized Jewishness which is built on value rather than on history. Uh, so I, I would actually, in a way, defend the, the Jewish uh, as a construction at least of the Enlightenment that is taken seriously and that is a kind of um, critique of uh, nationalism, Zionism, etc. In other words, various modern forms of the essentialization of an identity. So I wonder, I'm sure you've considered this, I, I wonder how that fits into your argument. Thank you. One more question, Ariella. Thank you a lot. It was very uh, interesting to listen to your talk, and I liked very much the way that you speak about that the anti anti semite uh, these are actually the community or the anti semite are becoming the community, and there are no Jews. But my question to you would be about the Jews. How come that the Jews continue to be the Jews when we know that the history of the Jews with the uh, not a capital letter, but with a minuscule letter, is a history of diverse Jews. Uh, so uh, you started with Gilani Jar, and you started with the exclusion of the Arab or the Muslim, but it seems like it's the exclusion of the Arab or the Muslim as the others. But what about the exclusion of the Arab and the Muslim within the Jews? And I'm speaking about Arab Jews or Muslim Jews or Berber Jews. So this would be my first question. How do you deal in these Jews out of the question with the diversity of Jews, diversity of community of Jews? Um, my second question, very brief, is that you spoke about Jews who lost connection to Judaism. You spoke about assimilation. And it seems like it happened by itself. But there is a very strong European project prior to the Holocaust, which is killing the Jews within the Jews. 
in diverse communities in Europe and later on in North Africa and the Middle East when they wanted to actually regenerate the uh, Muslim Jews or Arab Jews and to make them into European Jews, which means Jews without Jews. So where I know that you, you, know, you had only 40 minutes and you couldn't give all the history, but how do you deal with this history in order for it not to sound like they lost their connection to Judaism? And um, I had one last question. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, Three that's... Questions, <laughs> I said. Uh, you speak about knowledge, uh, a collective without knowledge, and you uh, very persuasively showed us what happened to this collective without knowledge. It is perceived without knowledge. But knowledge doesn't uh, exist outside of a worldliness. And I think that when we uh, take, for example, the Jews of North Africa, knowledge is uh, inseparable from craft. And this is also true for Eastern Europe. I don't know about Western Europe, but for Eastern Europe it's also true. So how do you approach knowledge in its worldliness and not just as a body of knowledge that the Talmud can now stand for? Sorry, Elad, three became five. But I, will, I, will, I, will, I will do my best. <laughs> I'll do my best. I hope I remember all the questions. If I don't, uh, just remind me. I'll start with Derrida. Uh, if I had uh, 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 60 minutes instead of 45, I would end with Derrida. Uh, but that's, that's, that's the... Uh, so, so thank you for the question. The, I, I completely agree with you that Derrida was uh, very much uh, in reaction to Levinas, was trying to problematize and warn about uh, uh, what's going to happen uh, if we go... Um, uh, with the political consequences of what Levinas was doing, going back to the Talmud and so forth. And are, are we not, and that was his point, are we not then reproducing anti-Semitism? Uh, that, that was his basic problem and, and, and concern. And, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's the next step. And after we, uh, we, we, uh, we, we reach the point of Levinas, then we can understand what Derrida was doing. I think, however, that Derrida was asking a question vis-à-vis -vis Levinas. It's, namely, he, uh, he, uh, he, he did not uh, uh, want to, and he repeated it in the last two decades, uh, did not want to uh, deny in any way any kind of connection to a certain tradition of something that he was very careful by saying what. Uh, but I think it's always important to see that he read Levinas very carefully and he saw that this is, has to be the way to go, namely go to some kind of a tradition of knowledge that I think uh, 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 Talmud would be one option of that and there are others uh, and, and, and only then you can work with Derrida. That, that would be my, uh, my direction with Derrida. As to, um, as to um, Jewishness and uh, essentialization. Um, I think what I was calling the uh, de-epistemized collective is essentialization, is precisely creating a collective that uh, is, in a sense, essence. It's a certain entity that, uh, that uh, e exists somehow as is in history, and uh, you either are or not that. Uh, and this is this uh, this essentialization. I think the only way of go of fighting against essentialization is to re-epistemize, namely to uh, see in what way precisely there is a nessism, uh, some kind of a tradition of knowledge. When I'm speaking about knowledge, I'm speaking about not only about theoretical knowledge, of course, about some kind of practices, mostly social political practices and so forth. Uh, so I would say, if you start to acknowledge a certain existence of social political praxis that you could call Jewish or not, then it starts to make sense to say I am that or not. Uh, and it's not just a, uh, a, a declaration of origins or of uh, some kind of uh, uh, mysterious belongings, but an actual practice of are you doing that or not. Uh, and, and then it makes or starts to make sense. Uh, can you talk about um, being somehow associated or connected to Jewishness without being associated with Judaism, namely non-halachic Jews and so forth. But I think this would be the way of treating this. And I think the problem precisely results from this uh, essentialization of, an, uh, uh, I would say, it's an entity without practice. Um, as, to the, um, um, as to the diversity, 
I, um, I don't treat this really in my book because my book is kind of a trying to deal with the very possibility of starting a, a intelligent discourse about, uh, about Jewish, Jewish something, Jewish practice, Jewish thought, and so forth and so forth. Of course, I agree with you that uh, once we start the discussion, yes, uh, we need to see. I, I just throw Talmud as a, you know, as a, as a suggestion. Others, others say Kabbalah. Other, yes, others say Midrash. Okay, we can debate what exactly we're talking about, and then start talking about the different directions that there is an actual uh, uh, intellectual history of that that has a geography and has a temporality and so forth. And then it makes, of course, start making sense about talking about uh, about the about the diversity and also about the let's say the European uh, Christian, maybe German Jewishness or Judaism vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim Arab uh, North African or Arab uh, uh, Jewishness. And I think this is what one of the projects that Derrida uh, was was starting to talk about. Um, as to the um, Emancipation and uh, pro European project of uh, of Jews without Judaism. Yes, uh, I think uh, this is when I when I asked to Nadia that uh, uh, what, what what I think is the problem uh, uh, with uh, Jewish knowledge and that the problem is associating uh, a knowledge or practice or thought with a historical collective. I think precisely this is the secularization of the theological critique against Judaism it, uh, that, that took place in the form of the modern republic in which the uh, Jews are to become citizens that can be Jews at home but, uh, uh, but, uh, but human beings uh, in the street. And I think this is definitely uh, the process of assimilation connected to emancipation that eventually also, and this is the more provocative thesis that I did not talk about, uh, also gave rise to the suspicions of anti-Semites. Uh, if you read uh, the anti-Semitic uh, uh, texts from the 19th century, it's all about the suspicion about where are the Jews. Uh, you tell us uh, that they all become citizens, but uh, what does it mean? Where is Judaism? So uh, I think uh, in this sense, the, it is a very complex problematic that you are absolutely right to point at, at the, um, at the emergence of, let's say, modern European political epistemology that uh, effaces Judaism and uh, by uh, way of consequence also, in a sense, gave rise to uh, anti-Semitism. The third question about praxis. Yes, when I say Talmud, I think this is precisely why I say Talmud, because Talmud is, uh, is not only, it's, it's not a theory. Uh, Talmud is definitely a, a as text, it's all around uh, praxis, it's all around halakha. And of course, uh, Talmudic cultures are Talmudic of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of social, political uh, practice of building communities and so forth. So I think this is one of the interesting things for me, in specifically going to Talmud and not, for example, to Kabbalah or to Midrash, because I think in the Talmud precisely, you have a very important uh, 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 element of, of praxis and normativity. Thank you. Okay, so we have time for another round. Uh, do you want, yes? Uh, can we have the microphone, please? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much for this really incredibly thought-provoking talk. Um, I hesitated to actually ask my question because it will repeat or reiterate, <laughs> but then I thought reiteration is maybe not a, not a bad thing. Uh, Elizabeth Weed's question, and in a way also Ariella Azule's question. So I was really struck as, as Elizabeth by the, the very strong um, dialectical uh, thread that, that runs through your presentation. Um, and I was also struck, that's where my question is maybe more a footnote than a uh, reiteration, also struck by the fact that negative dialectics uh, becomes included in the dialectic, uh, dialectical movement of anti, 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 etc. Um, but then what I thought is that um, if these this dialectics of, of Jewish identity, this dialectical identity, let's say, um, if it is 
hyper dialectic or, or a negative dialectic identity, still uh, there is some kind of, of nucleus uh, of identity that this whole dialectic circles around or comes back to um, in, in various complex ways. And so I was wondering, this is where um, I, I thought both about Derrida as continuing Levinas while criticizing him, uh, and, and about Ariela's question too, I was wondering what about, um, a, uh, let's say, a radical plurality of, of, uh, of the very notion of Jew. I, I don't mean only uh, the Jewish diaspora, the empirical, historical uh, dissemination, to take one of uh, Derrida's words, but also what about a radical dissemination that would um, uh, work or inhabit or haunt uh, the very notion of, of Jewishness? Thank you. Adi? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to take you back to the very beginning of your talk and, and uh, take the conversation a little bit down from its lofty height. Uh, you, you excluded uh, two paths uh, from the beginning in sen the sense, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. Instrumentalization and the uh, exclusion of the Arab or the Muslim. <clears throat> As if uh, taking Jews up the, out of the question, what you're doing, is, is an independent, separate word. I think that from, your, from the point of view that you propose to us, they're very much related. Uh, and that you actually uh, you uncovered a discursive stru structure that they inhabit together. Because at the, at the core of, of the present, at least, instrumentalization of anti-Semitism, there is a denial of questioning of Israel. Israel is out of the question. So you, you are not supposed to ask, what kind of regime is this uh, Jewish collective? And, and, and what kind of policies are they practicing, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, instrumentalization is the praxis mm -hmm. of taking political Jews, sovereign Jews, out of the question. And I think that uh, this, the, the other is, is a little more complicated to show how the exclusion of the Arab uh, is related to the Christian, actually basically Christian uh, universali universality and universalization uh, that, all, that is all in, in operation in the exclusion of, of, the, um, of real Jews mm -hmm. uh, from the anti-anti-Semite uh, mm -hmm. um, critique, a la Adorno and the whole crime, etc. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, yes, so I take two more questions, the gentleman and then you. Uh, um, I'm Mark Perlman from the music department. Thank you uh, for this, again, very thought-provoking uh, talk. I would like to try to put it in a, a maybe a different framework, and you can tell me if I've done so with, if I've done justice to it. Um, I'm thinking of the, what in political theory is called the identity dilemma, which is that claiming an identity has, you know, it, it makes you something, someone, but it also limits you. And normally, the pros and cons correlate with whether you are claiming the identity yourself or whether someone is projecting an identity upon you. And when you're claiming it yourself, it seems like freedom. When someone is projecting it upon you, it seems like a prison house. Uh, and I suspect that, this is, that what you're saying, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure about the, the epistemalized the epistemizing uh, issue. I thought I understood it, but then in your answer, uh, I started to doubt. But the other big example that strikes me as analogous is the American discourse on race, which in progressive circles centers around the, uh, the statement that race does not exist. And racism, is what exists. So 
it seems to me there might be an interesting comparison and contrast between this idea that Jews do not exist, only anti-Semitism exists, and race does not exist, only racists. Thank you. Um, yes, so this last question, and then we'll have to uh, well, over to you. Yes, I want to go back to this question of uh, negation, as uh, definitely this was for Adorno one of the main impact of his own thinking, and uh, he shared it, and therefore I think it's interesting that you made this difference to say your answer is the Talmud and not the Kabbalah, while for Adorno the answer would be Sholem's Kabbalah. Why? Because there, you know, you would have a kind of sort of uh, uh, negation in the, in the symptom and so on and so on. And so I think this is uh, uh, important because this would be, let's say, an integration of Jewish knowledge as a praxis of thinking, a practice of thinking. So I would not go for, uh, for your argument um, that uh, um, by uh, analyzing anti-Semitism, uh, they would denying Judaism, not at all, not at all. So I don't know why you are so insisting on this, because uh, I think you make a link uh, between what is this kind of, you know, implementation of Jewish thoughts and thinking and practices of life and so. Um, in the critical series you mention, and you say they have none. And I think it's just only half of the reading. So I wonder how you would bring this together, and does this, is a cons is a, let's say, as a consequence, is a difference between you, your point of view, and the one in, in the series, and Levinas, um, indeed about uh, 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 negativity? I mean, you cannot uh, stand negativity, so to say. I mean, what you know was actually Adorno's point in negative dialectics, to say one has to overcome negativity. It was not negative dialectic as an end state. It was seen as, and and that's where he would go with uh, 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 Sholem. And uh, so I, I doubt a little bit your, I mean, very, I mean, it's very convincing when one hears it, but I doubt it um, more when I go back to the texts themselves. Thank you. Well, over to you. Okay. <laughs> Again, I will try. Uh, I will start from the end. The, uh, other side of the reading is the book. Uh, you're absolutely right that uh, not only Adorno and Horkheimer, also Arendt and Badiou are more complex than what I presented here. What I, what I did is I tried to use them, so to speak, uh, at certain moments in their texts to show uh, a certain overarching uh, a broader narrative. In, in the book, I show how each of them also had other moments in their readings that counter that so that's not representative of what they were doing, and I agree with you. And this is uh, I'm, I'm trying to uh, show it in the book that uh, that that in Adorno and Horkheimer there are also other moments precisely what you're talking about. This trying to going later to Kabbalah uh, or to uh, specifically in the text about anti-Semitism, they are going to uh, they're trying to compare the negativity. Uh, in Hegel to, uh, not to the Tzimtzum, but to the Bildenverbot, the, uh, the prohibition on images. Uh, so, so they are trying to, to negotiate that. So I agree with you, it's, 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 it's not a fair position of Adorno, what I showed here, I was really uh, using them. That's about uh, Adorno and Hochheimer. About, uh, maybe I just to Derrida. Um, uh, continuing this, yes, I, 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 I completely agree that the next step, well, how I see that the next step will be to uh, uh, go and problematize what we mean by a collective, a collective subjectivity uh, in general and what we mean by Jewish. And I think Derrida is definitely has done uh, a lot to help us do precisely this. What I would suggest, and what I think uh, Derrida doesn't do himself, but this is why I think it's important to read him together with Levinas, is that Derrida left it as a, as a more of a kind of theoretical, subjective understanding, you know, I am the last Jew, I am the last of the Jews, and so forth. But then, of course, the question is, how does it become a, uh, a collective thing? How does it become a politics, even? Uh, 
And I think with this question, you should go to the Talmud. And, 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 and I think and it, it seems to me that many moments in Derrida also show that he was thinking something similar, that if there is any way of making sense of uh, 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 some kind of a Jewish knowledge tradition, which would not just repetition of, uh, of uh, collective chauvinism, it would have to be along these lines. I, I think he, for different reasons, he never that did it himself, actually stepped into the Talmudic or whatever other Jewish text and tried to show that. I'm not sure why, but uh, I think one of the reasons because he was looking closely what Levinas was doing. By the way, I think Levinas was not able to do that. Uh, but that, that, but that, that's a different issue. Uh, I, I think the Talmud is interestingly read as a kind of a, a collective performance of what Derrida was answering. And by the way, the Talmud are no Jews. The, 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 the speaking subject in the Talmud doesn't call themselves Jewish. It's a, and, and there is a reason for that. They knew that, uh, that there is Jewish, but they were not calling themselves this. Okay. So that about uh, um, Derrida. About um, the race, uh, there is no race, they are only racist. Yes, I think the analogy is, uh, is, is very strong. And I think it is precisely Sartre who uh, established uh, this analogy textually uh, and also at the same moment, uh, precisely uh, when he was writing uh, uh, the Jews in anti-Semitic, he was also writing uh, Black Orpheus. And uh, 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 almost the same year, and this is exactly where he was making the point uh, of what he called anti-racist racism, namely the uh, assertion of, uh, in this context, the black, uh, the black uh, uh, identity, the black culture, uh, the, negri the entire discourse of negritude. That was the exactly, uh, uh, and, 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 and and I think there is an analogy between his his suggestion you need to assert the Jewish. Uh, uh, identity as a uh, in, in in a political fight uh, against anti-Semitism as as a, as a Jewish and you need to assert the black consciousness and black culture in a kind of so to speak a counter uh, uh, an answer to uh, European colonialism I think uh, and it was influential on both both sides the only thing that I would add to that is that uh, I I think I. I don't know enough about uh, you know African context and so forth, but I think other people made similar arguments that there is a way of uh, mobilizing politically uh, Jewish uh, identity and, and, and history that is not only in response to anti-Semitism but has its own resources. This is this is what I uh, what I suggest, and I think people who are talking about African epistemology and also uh, of the global South try to do the, the same thing, saying it's not only a reaction. They're only resources that have been uh, obliterated. Uh, Israel. Yes, I, I think there is an Israel out of the question. Uh, I think that this is precisely right. This is precisely the what I what I find still problematic in the in the Jerusalem Declaration. Uh, Jewish institution as Jewish. Uh, I mean, th there is a state that uh, it's called itself Jewish and does politics explicitly as Jewish politics. And uh, uh, if you want to deal with that effectively, then you need to acknowledge there is uh, a claim for uh, Jewish politics that also claims to um, uh, realize some kind of uh, Jewish history and tradition and so forth. Uh, and if you, uh, you cannot just ignore that. So there is definitely a way that you should criticize uh, Israeli politics as Jewish uh, and not as anti-Jewish, but so to speak, as an inner critique within uh, Judaism itself. Uh, and I think it is today uh, something that should be, uh, should be done, uh, which diverges from uh, a traditional kind of liberal way of dealing with the um, politics of Israel only in the name, so to speak, of uh, human rights, universalism, and so forth, and obliterating the fact that there is an entire Jewish uh, uh, world of discourse and thought that is uh, a very essential part of that. So I, I agree with you about that. Uh, as to how that then connects to the question of the Muslim and the Arab, okay, politically we see that very clearly. Um, i still not sure uh, what would it mean then if, uh, so to say, we go beyond anti-Semitism to Jewish knowledge, how you then deal with that and how is it connected. I guess it goes probably to uh, the direction that uh, the that was pointing about and uh, showing, you know, uh, uh, precisely 
how within Jewish knowledge itself there is uh, precisely the Muslim Arab Jewish knowledge vis-a-vis the European one uh, that uh, an, an, an inner, so to speak, tension with it, uh, the Jewish episteme that needs to be uh, problematized. But okay, that's that's maybe just a kind of hunch uh, idea that I have. It's not something that I can say much more about now. Uh, I think I uh, remembered everybody. I didn't forget any. Yeah, you did an amazing job of, uh, <laughs> of holding all the questions. Thank you so much. Please help me and thank you. For that. And uh, also many thanks to all of you who attended in person and those of you who are attending online. Thank you. Thank you.